Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sloan Harper. I'm chair at IFIC Ireland. Delighted to welcome you all to our webinar uh, on Living Well as Possible. Uh, I also want to introduce my uh, co-chair and colleague, Paula Pinto. Paula is program manager for policy and engagement at the All Ireland Institute for Hospice and Palliative Care. We have an excellent range of speakers this afternoon, and we've had a wonderful turnout for this webinar. Um, so we're looking forward to uh, getting going and getting some useful discussion and feedback from yourselves. Um, next slide, please. So we're, we're part of the International Foundation for Integrated Care. Um, it's a not-for-profit organization that inspires, influences, and facilitates the adoption of integrated care in policy and practice around the world. And we have a vision that is people, families, and communities benefit from person-centered integrated care and support to maximize health, well-being, and independence. Next slide. So Ithaca Ireland is linked to the University College Dublin. We're delighted to have their support uh, and uh, for me as chair to have the support of our two directors, Professor Anya Carroll, Professor of Healthcare Improvement and Integrated Care at UCD, and Fiona Lyne, Director of Communications at IFIC. Uh, and we're well supported too by our steering group, uh, including Jackie Brown, our service user representative, and our operations and research team. Next slide. Um, as in previous years, we've been going for four years now, but uh, we have a number of important work streams. This webinar series is part of our uh, knowledge mobilization initiative, uh, but we have a, a broad range of educational uh, research and collaborative projects uh, underway, not least palliative care, and we're looking forward to developing those ideas this afternoon uh, with all of you. Next slide, please. Those are our aims and objectives, uh, principally to advance the, the science knowledge and adoption of integrated care and policy and practice across the island of Ireland uh, and further afield. Next slide. Next slide, uh, please, Fiona. And finally, uh, those are our contact details. Um, our uh, colleague, uh, Karen O'Connell, has moved on, uh, and David Lenane uh, is now our principal support. And uh, David can be uh, contacted by email if you have any queries or want to forward any ideas. Thank you. Next slide. So I'm delighted to hand over to Paula, uh, uh, who will give an overview of the Institute's work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sloan, and welcome, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Paula Pinto. I'm Program Manager for Policy and Engagement at All Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care. And I want to take this opportunity to thank IFIC because a few months ago, when I reached out to Fiona Lynn about the possibility of hosting a webinar together during Palliative Care Week, she jumped at the opportunity. And you have lined up amazing speakers for us today. And there's been a huge interest. So thank you. I also want to take this opportunity to share with you a little bit about what All Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care does. Uh, next slide, please. So we are a membership organization of hospices, universities, charities, health and social care organizations across the island of Ireland. We currently have 26 members and we seek to build partnerships, promote shared learnings and integrating palliative care across the health system. Next slide. We aim to improve the palliative care experience for people with life-limiting conditions and their families. Oh, yeah, you can leave it. Well, up am that I slide. am I on the right slide? I'm so sorry, I wouldn't move forward, Paula. That's, that's okay. You can leave it there. That's okay. <laughs> no worries. That's fine. So, um, as I mentioned, we aim to improve the palliative care experience for people with life-limiting conditions and their families through research, education, and practice, and policy and engagement. And in relation to engagement, we are currently in the middle of our ninth annual palliative care week. And we carried out a survey to inform the week and have a better understanding of people's perceptions about palliative care. And the results show that 78% of people 
of adults across the island of Ireland think about end of life when they hear the term palliative care. 46% of adults think about cancer when they hear the term palliative care. And 46% of adults feel that they do not have enough information to have conversations or make decisions about palliative care or end of life care. So misconceptions about palliative care persist, which means there are people who may not be benefiting of palliative care services and hence be losing out on a better quality of life due to lack of awareness or information. And that's why this public campaign is so important. And throughout this week, we want to encourage people to talk about palliative care and its different facets it's not only about end of life, but also about symptom management and respite. And it's not only for advanced, care, advanced cancer patients, but for other life-limiting conditions too. So we want to encourage all of you to take part of what remains of the week. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we have a, a number of excellent speakers and I want to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Xavier Gomez Batista from the University of Vic in Spain. Uh, Professor, uh, you're very welcome today. Um, Professor Gomez Batista is director of the Holly Observatory of the ICO and chair of palliative care at the Faculty of Medicine in the University of Vic. And Xavier is also a former director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Public Health Palliative Care Programs. Uh, you're most welcome and we look forward to hearing from you. And everyone get your fingers busy on the keyboards and get those questions coming in. Paul is going to pull those together uh, and we'll consider those after we've heard from our final speaker. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, um, I think Fiona will help me in addressing the, the slides because uh, she, she had it from the beginning. Uh, I wanted to be and express my gratitude to be here because it's an opportunity to share with you in several times we did so. And now I think that we uh, can share uh, the thing I think uh, I say is uh, gaps that we uh, identified in the evolution of palliative care. As you can see in the diapositive in the slide, we are happy for palliative care development in our country. Okay, in Catalonia, we have quite a lot of services of palliative care, but there are gaps in palliative care provision. Even with uh, an extended uh, network of services, there are people not achieving and having access to these uh, services. And I wanted just to tell you about three of these gaps of the system. The next one, please. Uh -huh. Well, the first is uh, that still being in general, that it's true that the intervention of palliative care service is very late. And the mean length of intervention is three to four months, but we know people uh, suffer from uh, palliative care needs, unmet needs during years. So the first challenge is to identify them very, very early in the evolution, timely. And this is also not easy because it depends of the most um, uh, community-based services. So they need to understand this and practice this. The next, please, the next one, please. Uh, so we have developed a method to do so, the next one, please, which is just mixing six very simple parameters um, of uh, clinical issues, needs that you can identify very easily. And you mix these parameters because all of them have influence and uh, have prognostic value. You in the next, please, the next uh, diapositive, please, you can identify three very easily in clinical grounds, three stages of evolution of palliative care needs in patients from chronic conditions, especially frailty and dementia and other chronic conditions, um, mainly related to aging, but also um, cardiac or organ failures, as, as you can also identify. And this can be done 
three years before they die. So it's it's not difficult to do so. That's the first challenge that we haven't uh, yet resolved in our settings. The next one, please. And we did so, and also we have an APP that uh, every GP can use in, in their mobile to identify this um, prognostic issue and, and this prognostic approach added to the palliative approach. So that's the first challenge and the gap we couldn't so far cover in our settings and experiences. The next slide, please. The second issue is that um, even, but we had developed palliative care services. The next one, please. There is a, uh, and, and you can see this in our region, it's quite extended in terms of beds and home care support teams and hospital support teams. The next one, please. We identified that uh, pro, more or less 40% of people are attended by specialist palliative care teams, and this is good. 35% are attended by primary care services, GPs with training and identification tools of, of uh, palliative care needs. But there is a population of 28% of the, of the population with palliative care needs, which is not identified and don't reach palliative care services in our uh, region. So that's a, a gap in our system. The next one, please. Who are these people? These people are mainly, the next one, please, uh, women with uh, more than 80 years old, with poverty, isolation, and uh, limited access to social and healthcare services. So we are implementing a sort of hospice program in the communities, starting in Barcelona City, to address the needs of these people who are not yet uh, achieving the, the privilege and the right to be attended by palliative care services or palliative care approach in primary care. And the third, the next one, please. The third challenge is that we identified as I think is the same in, in many countries in Europe, is the, the, the need to implement palliative care and especially psychosocial palliative care in nursing homes. So we think that this is another gap in many systems, even having quite a lot of home care services or palliative care services in units or in hospitals. So the next one, please. So we think that um, from the La Caixa program, which is psychosocial, and the next one, and has implemented quite a lot of psychosocial teams, and also from our uh, experience as compassive community, we have Next one, please. Focus very specially in, we, you can see quite a lot of psychosocial teams in all over Spain. The next one, please. And we are focusing in nursing homes combination with the combination of early identification there with training in more than 50% of, the, of nursing homes in the region and also making research and coaching and also um, uh, volunteers implementation, a psychosocial uh, implementation of services very specific to nursing homes. So the next one, please. Even when we have the perception that we have quite a lot of structures of palliative care in our region, there, are, there is a lot of work to be done to address these gaps. That's the message I wanted to tell you, because I think it's very a very common gap in many countries in Europe. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you very much. I'm finished. Thank you, Xavier. Next, we have Alison Bunce from Compassionate Improvised Scotland. 
Compassionate Inverclyde is a social movement which inspires ordinary people to do things for ordinary to do things for ordinary people by tapping into our desire to be kind, helpful, and neighborly. Allison Bunce has been program lead for Compassionate Inverclyde since 2016. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's working with um, Ethics Scotland in the past with Professor Anne Hendry um, and have been to many of the conferences. Uh, so I'm a big supporter um, around the, the globe. Um, I'm not sure, oh, I wasn't sure if Fiona managed to get my slides, but I'm delighted um, that she's been able to do that. So next slide, please. Yeah, I, I've been in post since 2016, but my first year, um, which was a really important year before we launched it officially in March 2017, was that I went out and spoke to every single group that we had officially in Inverclyde um, to ask what actually was it like to live in Inverclyde because we recognised, uh, and my background's in palliative care, I worked as director of care at our Gown Hospice for nine years before leading this programme. So we understood that the demographics were changing. People were living longer, the oldest person was going to get even older, but we didn't have the healthcare resources in order to um, accommodate or support that. So we looked at um, Professor Alan Kelleher's work and the, the guru in public health approaches to palliative care and recognised that we had 80,000 people in our community that we could use, utilise, empower, and um, as ordinary people, helping ordinary people, to, to um, especially in times of crisis. Next, time, next slide, please. So this was, our, this was our aim, to create Scotland's first compassionate community. And in particular, around, at times of crisis and at the end of life and loss, um, where ordinary people can help ordinary people. And that came from really the action plan for the our Scottish government, uh, action plan for end of life care, recognise that commu communities needed to be part of that equation, working alongside health professionals. Next slide, please. So we had a board set up and this was the objectives. Um, we, they were very brave and we didn't have any outcomes, but we have work streams under all of these different well-being, compassionate citizenship, education around kindness, and creating compassionate organisations. Next slide, please. So this is really important. This is about what it's not and what it is. It's a social movement. It's not another palliative care service. It's not another service. It's not about health professionals. It's not prescriptive, but it is a way in which we can work alongside health professionals, um, as we heard in our last speaker. Um, saying that there, there was gaps in around how volunteers can help at the end of life and especially in social isolation and, um, and periods of loneliness. We looked at how our community of people could work alongside and, and we have evolved Compassionate Inverclyde as in that way. Next slide, please. And these were words way back when I, I did that engagement at the very start. These were what people said that Inverclyde, to live in Inverclyde was compassionate, helpful and neighbourly. So we had these key values in our school, if you like, that we were able to build on. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I, maybe this is um, where we start thinking about how ordinary people can help at the end of life in a meaningful way. So we set up a No One Dies Alone programme. It was the first in Scotland. And it's around trained volunteers sitting at the very end of life with people who don't have any family and friends. Um, that we have supported now 109 patients. We couldn't do it during COVID. 
But that is that program is invaluable. And just a, a very quick um, story. We were able to support last week a lady who's 105 in the community, and she her wish was that she would die at home. And her healthcare workers came in and her district nurses came in and we worked alongside. We were the gap that would have been our family. We sat all day and all during the night for five days until that lady died. And she died in her own home, um, which was her wish. We've sat for over 3,500 hours, all volunteers, um, and it, that's really making a difference on, in the wards and the hospital as well. We do other things like back home boxes and, and visit elderly people um, at, at home. Also work with new mums. We have a friendship pub um, for people to come along to. So very many different strands. But really, if we're focusing today on the end of life, then the, the No One Dies Alone programme has made the biggest difference to that. Next slide, please. And the, these are not great slides, but it's just to um, let you know of the vastness of the relationships that, that we have in our community. And next slide. And next slide as well. So during lockdown, just like everyone else, we had to think in a different way. And these are some of the ways um, in which that we, we helped. And I'm trying to, to speak quickly. Um, and the time limit, because I want to really um, share with you the really exciting programme that we're doing within Inverclyde at the minute around a whole systems approach to uh, bereavement. It's much more strategic than um, Compassionate Inverclyde, which is organically grown at it with ordinary people. A whole systems approach to bereavement is around looking at how are, our, are the people that are employing us, our employers, how are they supporting us if we were bereaved going back to work? What's the information like in our community for people who have been bereaved? Do we have resources to provide support? Do we have people who are listeners? Wait, what about our community centres? What about um, no matter where you live, can you tap into bereavement support in 20 minutes? So it's a huge piece of work, but it's really exciting. And it, it endorses the vision for Scotland of the bereavement charter for Scotland. Um, and we are doing it as a pilot in Inverclyde as a local, uh, a local programme. Next slide, please. So this is where it fits into our Scottish Government national performance indicators. So sometimes when you speak about compassion or communities, you know, it, it, it kind of like we don't use that language. We don't, you know, we're businesses, we're doing X, Y, and Z. But this is what our Scottish, this is what our government are saying, that we are a society which treats all our people with kindness, dignity, and compassion. And I hope that our compassionate communities movement at the end of people's lives is making a difference because we can engage, empower, and allow our community who, who people are inherently kind and they need opportunities to, to help out. It can be done in a meaningful way, but it's not just meaningful for the people who are doing it. It's meaningful for the people that are being supported and it's, almost, and it's also meaningful for Scottish government. Next slide, please. We've won 13 awards and we very recently won the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. Um, I work with over 140 volunteers and I'm the only paid member of staff. Um, so it's quite remarkable that our community have really um, embraced this, this movement and um, we are just building on that. Um, Next slide, please. I'm just going to end with this feedback because I have got more um, slides, but I think, I think it's quite nice um, just to hear 
I'll read the top feedback. This was from an, a no one dies alone relative, just to get the impact of actually what we're meaning by this, how a compassionate community can really help someone at the end of their life and their families. Dad died on the 24th of July with Gillian by his side. I have no regrets about not being able to be there with him because I knew that Gillian was. She also went over and above what I would have expected by waiting at the hospital until I arrived so that she could share her last, his last moments. And this is something that I will never forget. And if there's any way that I can help promote or support NODA moving forward, please don't hesitate to let me know. That made such a difference and knowing for that lady, knowing that one of the companions was sitting with um, her, her dad and was able to share with her the actual moments of his death and that he was peaceful, that he was sleeping and that Gillian was there when, when actually his daughter couldn't be there. Um, and I have many, many more examples of that. Um, but it just, it's just a glimpse into how we can engage our communities in a meaningful way to support people at the end of their life and in other situations. So thank you, Fiona. I, I would just stop the slides there because um, I would run out of time going over them all. So um, yeah, a wee glimpse and I'm happy to answer questions at the end whenever the question and answer session is. Thank you. Paula or Sloan, are you just going to introduce our last speakers? Here you go. Thanks, Paula. Sure, sorry, Fiona. Um, our last speaker is Denise Cranston and Dr. Tracy Anderson from Southeastern Trust, Northern Ireland. Denise Cranston is the palliative care lead for the Southeastern Trust Rapid Access Hub for palliative care at the Southeastern Trust in Northern Ireland. And Dr. Tracy Anderson is a palliative medicine consultant in the Southeast Health and Social Care Trust. Hello, um, I'm Tracy Anderson. So I'm here with Denise. I'm also here with um, oh, I'm here with okay. I'm also here with Ray Elder, our strategic lead, and our specialist nurses and pharmacists who work in the service that I'll be telling you about over the next um, ten minutes. So we were just asked to give an update on our um, the, our recent. Um, innovation of our rapid access hub for palliative care patients within the North Down and Arts community area. So this is, a, if you want to move on to the next slide, this is a consultant led rapid access unit which provides short term intervention for palliative care patients who have complex needs in this area um, and, and we provide multidisciplinary input. If you want to move on to the next slide. Um, we receive referrals from both the acute hospital and also the community area. So um, our specialist palliative care team in the acute hospital, which we're all part of, as well as the community um, aspect of our work, um, will provide some of our referrals alongside our other hospital colleagues or other rapid access hubs within the trust. And then from the community side of things, we receive referrals from the hospice nurse specialists in the community, the uh, allied health professionals, and also from GPs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we do have um, myself um, and a, a, a rotation of a specialist nurse um, and each of us work three sessions per week in the community and the rest of our sessions are in the acute hospital. Um, and we have a pharmacist that has two sessions per week with us again combined between community and hospital. So that provides continuity for patient care across the care settings. Um, we have a, a weekly multidisciplinary meeting, which also includes um, staff that work purely in the community with the specialist nurses and allied health professionals. Um, so the, the, the patients that we discuss at our weekly MDT meeting are those who have advanced and progressive life limiting illness um, and they have either complex symptoms or complex allied health needs for physio, OT, uh, social work, dietitian, speech and language therapist or complex psychosocial needs um, for our social worker chaplaincy input. Um, 
So next slide, please. So the, the most complex of those patients, as well as being discussed at the weekly MDT meeting, will be seen by um, consultant, specialist nurse um, or pharmacist. Um, and that may be at, at, by telephone advice for GPs and, and specialist nurses, or that might be face to face review either in our centre or at the patient's home if they're unable to come to our centre and often we will um, make some of our reviews by telephone as well. So next slide please. So our aim is to manage the patient's symptoms at home um, and work closely with our local hospices with the, the aim of minimising admissions to the acute hospital. And then on the other side of it, then with the patients who are in hospital, we aim to then provide an early review after discharge and hope that that might shorten the patient's length of admission. Um, and the fact that the, the staff that work here work across both sites really helps with that continuity. Um, yeah, please move on to the next slide, thank you. Um, so as I said before, we, we're, we're aiming to have a short intervention so that we can see patients very quickly when, they're, when they are referred. Um, so we will discharge them from our caseload when we have a stable uh, plan of care, but we make it very easy for either the our wider team in the community who may be seeing these patients on an ongoing basis to easily refer back to us. And if the patient is discharged from all of our service, the GP can easily refer, refer back for further review. So the next couple of slides, I want to just highlight um, through our scorecard that we have produced to just highlight the, the, the type of work we do, um, the outcome measures we use and the numbers of patients we see. That first slide is, is what I've already talked about. So we'll move on from that um, to the next slide, please. Um, it's, it, it's hard to make sense. I'll just, I'll just briefly talk through it, but um, the number in the middle there are the number of patients that um, we would have discussed over a three month period in our MDT. So that's 65 patients. And then bottom right, there's an additional 18 patients who needed advice, special palliative care advice. So over that three month period, we've had input for 99 patients um, in our trust, in, in this aspect of our trust area. Um, so the sort of left on, on top of that first picture highlights those most complex patients who need to see either consultant specialist nurse or pharmacist so some of those will be um uh, by ad advice that has been provided to other professionals and then the the top part of that picture highlights the the 29 patients who actually needed face-to-face -face, um consultant review um, and, and a number of those patients needed numerous reviews and some of those were joint reviews by myself specialist nurse and pharmacist and some of them would have been um by maybe just one or two members of of, of that small aspect of the team. So that just gives you a sense of the kind of patients that we're seeing and the numbers of patients. Um, moving on to the right hand side of the slide is um, us trying to develop um, outcomes um, to, to show how well um, we are doing this work. Um, that's been quite a challenge for us just to identify what are the right outcomes. So um, what we are currently working with are how many of our patients are able to remain in their preferred place of care, how many of them have improved symptom control, and how many have moved from an unstable plan of care to a stable plan of care. And then if we move on to the next slide, then we're trying to make it, a, 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 so the, the next outcome measure is really around how many patients we feel have avoided a hospital mission because of the services we've been able to provide for them in the community. So of that group of patients that I've talked about, 71% of those did avoid hospital admission and managed to be cared for at home with their symptoms managed at home or directly admitted to hospice. But inevitably, there is a number of patients who do need admitted to hospice. Um, in this group, it was 29% of those patients, which are 19 patients. And of those 19 patients, I think maybe only one of those patients would should, should maybe have stayed at home and not gone to hospital. Every other patient had a very valid reason, as you can see on the slide, for, for needing an acute hospital admission. But the lovely thing about the continuity between the care and the, and the staff working across both sites is that those patients are then picked up by the specialist palliative care team in the hospital environment. And then out of those 19 patients, um, 12 of those were able to be discharged. Now, two were to hospice, but of the 10 who were discharged back home, then nine of those were then able to be followed up by our community palliative care centre here. Um, so it just highlights um, the continuity of care um, be between, between community and hospital. Um, so uh, in that three month period, um, 
in our analysis of what bed days we could have saved, um, we, we believe that from the early discharge and, and close follow up afterwards, um, there were 43 days saved from the patient review that reviews that were referred from community settings um, 171 days. And for those patients who went directly to hospice 101 days. So when you total that up, that's over 300 um, hospital bed days saved by patients accessing our service here in the community over that three three month period. Um, so the next slide is just a very short case example of the kind of patient that we have seen here. So a 73 year old man referred from a, a, a nurse, a GI nurse specialist with a cholangiocarcinoma, but quite severe liver capsule pain. We were able to see him six days after referral and it would have been shorter if there hadn't been a bank holiday. Um, we altered his analgesics, gave him a trial of steroids, checked his bloods and then had numerous telephone reviews over the following um, three weeks. His symptoms had improved initially and we were managing his steroids, decreasing the dose, managing side effects. Um, next slide, please. And then, uh, then we were able to pick up then because of the regular phone reviews that his symptoms then were, were getting worse um, and then able to organize a, a further face-to-face -face review where we're able to increase um, medications again, order bloods and chest x-ray and order a CTPA with a view of then getting that done as an outpatient and following him up um, after that investigation. So I hope this is an example of somebody who definitely did have a hospital admission avoided by regular input and investigations ordered as an outpatient patient. So moving on to the next slide, or the next three slides are really just a, a highlight of, of some of the patient feedback. I'm not going to read it in detail, but any patient feedback we've received so far has been really positive about the, the, the impact this has had on, on them and their symptoms and their quality of life. Um, so then moving on to the last slide, just to highlight the recent developments in our service, um, we have been able to, um, uh, sorry, moving on to, the, uh, again, slide, please. Um, so we've been able to employ a rapid access physio and occupational therapist, um, and that allows us to be able to, to be able to do joint reviews, um, joint multidisciplinary reviews in the in the centre here. Um, we've also um, been able to um, um, employ the CNS sessions with with some money that has come from our um, rapid access initiative, um, and that has allowed us to have greater focus on early discharge from hospital and early follow up. Of, with specialist nurses post discharge and one of our nurses is in process of doing a, a quality improvement project to highlight the the impact of this and um, so as i've highlighted earlier i think we have saved hospital bed days um, and we hope that we'll be able to have ongoing specialist nursing input to continue to do that if we can um, secure ongoing funding thank you Thank you to all the speakers for their very interesting presentations, and I only wish we had more time to dive deeper. We have a few questions that have come, come in, uh, but also if you have questions, feel free to add them in the chat box, or if you raise your hand, we can unmute you and you can ask directly. Um, Xavier, one of the questions that came in is, what is the uptake and usage of the app that helps to identify prognosis with the six parameters that you mentioned? Thank you very much for this question. Really, uh, the, the the history of this is that we we identified that six parameters were already individually linked to prognosis, which is you know if you think that there are needs, uh, the functional decline, the nutritional decline, the multimorbidity, the use of resources, and uh, individual aspects of uh, disease stage. Uh, so if you mix this, then you can have a very easy um, approach to, to prognosis. It's true that prognosis must be um, used with a very prudent um, approach because, you know, it's uh, delicate to, to, to start the prognosis discussion with patients, but it's also very important to keep prognosis as one of the issues that you must know and uh, address and work with, because it's true that uh, these stages, uh, different stages have different aims and obviously different aims for uh, the patient and the family. So it's not only this. Uh, we are happy with this because it's, 
it's true that it's very simple, very feasible, and very useful in any, every setting. Thank you, Xavier. Alison, we had a few questions come in for yourself in relation to volunteers. Um, how do you get around the guard of editing and all other barriers to volunteering? I assume you know what process do you have in place and maybe how long does the onboarding process take? Yeah, so every person who um, would be working with a vulnerable adult would go through the um, PVG scheme in Scotland and the protection of vulnerable groups um, check. It, it's quite straightforward um, and it doesn't take a long period of time. For the likes of the back home boxes, the volunteers, because they're not with, with vulnerable adults, they can actually just come and join and um, fill out the application form. I meet them, have a chat, a couple of um, references, but they don't need the, the PVG check. So it can be really, really quite soon after um, the initial discussion about um, they would like to help out that they can actually do it. Um, the way we support volunteers would be that we have, for the no one dies alone people, we would have a monthly circle, a circle of support. And within that circle, we would use values-based reflective practice um, and look at how, in a creative way, um, reflection and also then use the other half of the meeting just for really building relationships and um, general chat. And also anyone who would want a one-to-one -one, um, chat our support can can access that as well um so i'm not sure if that answers the questions but that's how we would keep keep the volunteers safe and supported perfect and there's also another question in relation to confidentiality and how you deal with that in the organization yeah so <clears throat> within um so every volunteer who would work with us would sign a confidentiality clause just like any other person um we don't so in the No One Dies Alone program, we don't need to know what the person's dying of. All I asked the nurse to let us know would be, what's the age of the person? Are they conscious? Are they unconscious? Are, are they actively dying? Are they kind of in the last three days of life, if, that, if they can actually um, understand that? But we just need to know the name and the age so that the volunteer can build a picture of who they're going to sit beside, but it's not important for us to have any other details about any illness or um, what they're dying from. Um, so we, we, we would have anything other than the name. Perfect. So I guess you keep it quite simple in order to avoid all those additional issues of having yeah. data protection and et cetera. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Denise yes. and Dr. Dr. Tracy, um, there was a, a comment in there in terms of there's a lot of work needed to provide seamless transition from acute care to home care, including palliative care, and that it's really good to hear the efforts uh, from Ireland. And in relation to the palliative care rapid response program that you mentioned, are there any plans of replicating maybe in other sites? Because I guess all these learnings are really valuable. Um, yeah, uh, we do have colleagues in other trust areas of our in our bigger trust um, who are trying to replicate something similar in, in other just so we have a trust wide. So that's all in development at the minute. Perfect. And do you think it's something that's scalable internationally as well, maybe outside? Because we have a few. Uh, people here from Canada, I think, mentioned. So do you think it's something that could be looked at? It's uh, it's Ray Elder here. So uh, yes, the programme, we're hoping to have a look at Frailty um, and uh, part, part Fear, sorry, I'm sitting in the doorway here because we're still <laughs> conscious of uh, COVID. Um, uh, the programme has been designed in such a way that it can be transferable across other palliative uh, conditions. Um, by the majority of our Patients would still be within the cancer uh, arena. We have seen a, a widening out of palliative care uh, provisions. So, one of Tracy's colleagues, uh, Dr. Kieran Core, is looking at Frailty uh, within the Down Hospital uh, on a similar model. And uh, Dr. Rachel Campbell is looking at uh, consequences of left sided heart failure around palliation within the Lagan Valley. And we're hoping to use the same model 
a, in terms of nursing pharmacists, a, a, et cetera, and then same a, reporting mechanisms in terms of the um, Department of Health for Northern Ireland. Um, so that's the plan. Uh, certainly, if anybody's interested from an international perspective, we would like to certainly have those uh, discussions about our learning um, and the feelings as well and challenges that, that we have found going forward. So quite happy to have those conversations probably going forward. Great, thank you. That sounds promising. Um, a few more questions coming in through the chat. And I think this one is aimed for Alison again. It says, is the restrictions of what volunteers are practically allowed to do and not allowed to do, such as assistance with toileting? Yeah, we, we um, are, the volunteers that we would have in the, the certainly in the No One Dies Alone program would be that they are being present, that they are just being like there, sitting, holding a hand, um, or just being present, they, they wouldn't ever toilet anyone or move anyone or do any physical care or anything like that. It would just be accompanying that person as, as, a, as a presence. Perfect. And we have one more question, which I think is open to all of you. It says, what is the most important message you would all give to anyone just starting to work in the area of palliative care? And Xavier, I think you wrote your answer, but maybe you want to expand a bit more and share it with uh, everyone. Uh, commitment, resilience, uh, patience, and going on. So we did all this uh, long um, journey from, and I think the first issue is to, to have a very good training, very, very intensive training, because if you are, um, well trained, you will probably address much better the the challenges of implementing palliative care. So it's well, it it takes time, but uh, but it's a very interesting. If you are passionate about this, I think uh, it's a, a very grateful uh, work. Uh, because you are helping people, especially if you are addressing palliative care for people with a special uh, vulnerability. That's very uh, grateful as helping people in difficult uh, situations. So it's, but uh, it takes time. Thank you. Uh, we have another question for uh, Den Denise and Dr. Tracy. They're asking, would Dr. Anderson's hub take in neutral pain Penic sepsis patients actively receiving chemo, as a trust I presently work in Northern Ireland, have to go through A and E and wait their turn, which I feel is not appropriate. Uh, our main focus would be on um, addressing complex symptom issues, and if somebody had an acute issue that needed a hospital admission, like neutropenic sepsis. Um, we would have to refer on to the acute hospital. So we wouldn't be able to manage that here because we're just an outpatient service. So I think somebody who is sick enough on chemo with neutropenic acceptance would have probably no option. They would, they would fit into our box of those hospital admissions that we just couldn't avoid. So we wouldn't be able to manage that as an outpatient, unfortunately. Um, I don't think any other questions are coming through at this moment. Again, if anybody does have more questions, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. Uh, otherwise, we also have the Q&A. And I don't know if maybe any of the panelists have questions for, for each other, because I know that the, the topics were very interesting as well. Uh -oh. Dr. Xavier, Professor. Uh, may, may to emphasize the need of identifying the gaps because it's uh, in many countries implementing palliative care. Uh, if you don't have a population-based perspective uh, that addresses you know, the population needs and, and identifying people with uh, higher uh, needs of palliative care implementation and knowing that some of these people are 
um, very um, are very far away from the palliative care services approach. Especially, we see this with, as I said, uh, with elderly women with uh, poverty, dementia, isolation, and perhaps uh, isolation from from conventional services. And this is more or less. 25% of the palliative care needs, and it's not addressed in many of our countries. And I think even if you have a very good services, you have to think if there is uh, pieces of the population that are not reaching these uh, people or reaching this very late in the evolution. And this is mainly uh, focused, yeah, as I said, in, in geriatric, uh, multi-morbid uh, women with dementia. So that's that's a very important issue because it's common in many countries. Thank you, Professor. And on that note, for example, uh, during Palliative Care Week right now, we have reached out to try uh, and, and listen to marginalized communities such as the LGBT community and people with disabilities. Uh, we're having actually a cafe event tomorrow just to under get their understanding of you know, where gaps may be that, you know, we may not be focusing on. So that's, um, it's a good point to make. Thank you. Don't think any more questions are coming in at this moment. Oh, um, Dr. Sloan, go ahead. Thanks, Paula. Um, it's a question for uh, Tracy and Denise in Southeast Trust and maybe Alison too. Uh, in the course of your projects, did you experience any barriers, any things you would love to change uh, to, to aid with the, the cause of collaborative working? Um, digital, financial, organizational, whatever. What would you do differently if you were running the system? I suppose um, one of the challenges that we've had is around staffing and um, because obviously um, in order to test this model of improvement and model of change um, requires you to um, use extra resources. So I suppose our big challenge has been around um, the funding and the, the recurrent funding for the nurses, for the pharmacist, for the, the, the other allied health professionals to be able to, um, to provide this service. And I suppose the other big challenge that we faced, we started this and then the pandemic happened. And a lot of the things then that we had um, um, planned to do, we had to put on hold um, because we weren't able to have those um, kind of face-to-face -face, um, consultations. Um, however, you know, as things um, changed, then we were able to bring our, our patient group um, back into the centre here and do that. But I would say probably um, it would be more about resources and recurrent funding and um, to keep things going and being able to then um, use the um, evidence that we have then to transfer that and, and, and spread it along um, the rest of the trust. So that would be kind of um, where we're at at the moment. Thank you. And I would probably just add to that in that because, you know, part of the argument for getting funding is, is proving what we've done. And mm -hmm. I think where palliative care is concerned, it's very hard to prove the worth of what we've done. So we've done our best with those scorecards to have numbers and percentages and things like that, but none of that really actually represents fully what we actually do, but you can't really represent that with numbers and figures. Yeah, thank you. Getting the evidence is, is so important. Yes. I, I suppose um, from the strategic viewpoint, um, I think the difficulty for palliation is the multi faceted aspect of palliative care delivery and the number of individuals involved in delivering palliative care. Um, <clears throat> and certainly when uh, the No More Silos program, program came out, um, I suppose it was convincing individuals that palliative care could be part of that program um, in terms of actually how we um, design the service. We had to be very uh, mindful of what that looked like. So if I give you an example, if you apply the thinking to uh, a gastro hub, for instance, for scopes, it's easier to look at the outcome measures. If you put another consultant in, you will get so many other people through the waiting list initiative. Whereas palliative care individuals, it is more difficult to demonstrate the benefit of keeping individuals out of hospital. 
And I suppose part of this, the antecedent for this work came from a piece of work that we carried out in emergency departments, where we looked at individuals who find themselves in an emergency department who were known either to palliative care or were diagnosed for the first time as having a palliative care need. And was there a different way to design the service going forward? So I suppose one of the big challenges Sloan is around about uh, helping people understand the complexity of palliative care and how we, we can fit that into other models of practice going forward and funding opportunities. Um, so the learning for me, um, I suppose, is don't say no to anything. Try and make this, the funding fit, um, as it were, um, within the palliative care uh, arena and challenge to say, well, actually, why could palliative care not be part of this funding model going forward? Thank you. Maybe Alison, uh, yeah. in terms of community work, uh, any barriers you would like to break down? Uh, no, I mean, not barriers, um, but the challenges have has been that it has grown arms and legs into areas that are no longer palliative care. So it was a public health approach to palliative care was the intention when it first started. But it, because it's community driven, it then has, you know, like it, it now supports new mums who are breastfeeding. Um, and the, 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 just the notion of how a community can support each other, it just doesn't end, you know, it's just not for the end of life. But if the funding is coming from the hospice, then there has to be the resource. Um, so that was why the, the local health and social care partnership got involved, because it was growing um, more than the public health approach to palliative care. Yes, from small seeds, mighty acorns grow. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, um, I think it's time to wrap up, folks. Uh, time has beaten us as ever. Um, do you want to put up the final slide, Fiona? Just with the contact, just next. Yeah, those are dates, dates for the diary. March 2023, All-Ireland Conference in Integrated Care. We had a, a very successful uh, meeting at UCD last March. Uh, and also we look forward to May in Antwerp and Flanders. Uh, ICIC 23, the 23rd International Conference on Integrated Care. And as Fiona said in the chat earlier, the call for papers is open now uh, and will be uh, until 31st of October. So uh, please do forward your research. We're, we're very excited about this uh, conference. And uh, finally, our, our contact details there. Uh, I, I just want to thank uh, all our distinguished speakers today for giving so generously of your time. Uh, it's been very much appreciated. Integration is such an, an important aspect of delivering successful palliative care. I want to thank colleagues at the All-Ireland Institute for Hospice and Palliative Care who've uh, worked uh, so hard today to, to bring this uh, webinar to fruition and Paula in particular, thank you, uh, as co-chair. Also, the EFIC Ireland team have done a brilliant job on uh, the logistics, but uh, not least of all, all of you who have joined with us today uh, in developing our learning system. Much appreciated, and I hope you found value in it. Thank you. Thank you all today for joining. Take care. Bye-bye.